Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone so much for joining us this morning. Um, my name is Sarah Whitney and I am the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Healthier Black Elders Center. I'd like to give a brief introduction of the Healthier Black Elders Center before we get started with our presentations. HBC started in 1997 and is funded by the National Institutes of Health. The center aims to address and reduce health disparities through research and education. We do this through a research registry where individuals learn about various social and behavioral research studies and may be invited to participate. Currently, we have about 1,200 active older Black adults in our registry, and we also host various events like the one today that provide health-related education to the community with a focus on aging. We provide education on a wide variety of topics, ranging from heart health to nutrition and oncology recovery, various many different things. Typically, we hold these events in person, and we hope that you're still able to enjoy this new virtual format in the meantime. To learn more about our program, please visit our website at www.mcuaaar.org or call our office at 313-664-2616. For anyone that is not currently an HBEC member and would like to join, please call our office to complete a survey and get added to our mailing list. You will then receive our biannual newsletter that lists program events, recruiting studies, and health information. I'm gonna say the website and phone number one more time. The website is www.mcu aaar.org and the phone number is 313-664-2616. Before presentations begin, I want to give a couple of housekeeping announcements. The webinar is being recorded and will be available to watch at a later time on our website. For those who are joining by computer, if you have a question for any of the speakers, please submit your questions in the Zoom chat or in the Q&A box at any time. The Q&A button can be found at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you are joining by telephone and you have a question that does not get answered by the end of our program, please call the HBEC office and leave a message with your question and one of our staff will follow up with you. Um, thank you, Vanessa, for putting the number in the chat. Again, that is 313-664-2616. So to start today's program, we have a short presentation on a newer segment for the Lunch and Learn series called Critical Crossroads. This will be followed by a brief presentation from a few researchers who are recruiting for their current research studies. Today's Critical Crossroads is the first installment of a larger conversation that we will be having as the, at the Healthier Black Elder Center around voting. Um, because engagement and influence in our community are really important pieces of social health and overall well being, our Critical Crossroads Committee has asked that we spend some time providing resources and information that will help support people as they prepare for the 2022 midterm elections. So, today I have a brief presentation on voter ID law in the state of Michigan. Um, the information that I'll be presenting can also be found at the Secretary's of State website. Give me one moment. Okay, so this will just be a little brief overview of Michigan voter ID laws, things that you need to know. The first thing is that picture ID is required when you're voting in the state of Michigan. Um, it's required that you have it with you at the polls. Your ID does not have to contain your address and it also may contain a shortened version of your name. So if your ID says Bill and your name is William, that's fine. If it says Kathy and your name is Kathleen, that's fine, things like that. Next, I'll just be sharing some acceptable forms of ID. So a Michigan driver's license is accepted. A Michigan state issue ID card is accepted. 
a driver's license or ID card issued by a state that is not Michigan, so any other states are also accepted. Federal or state government issued photo identification. A US passport. A military ID with a photo. A student ID with a photo, either from a high school or an accredited institution of higher learning, as well as a tribal identification card. If you are voting without a photo ID, um, if you don't have one, if you've misplaced it, there are still ways that you can cast your vote. Um, simply by signing an affidavit attesting that you are not in possession of your picture ID. So you'll want to let the poll workers know that you'd like to sign an affidavit instead because you do not have a photo ID with you. And you may be wondering, you know, would I qualify for this option? Are there any stipulations around that? So if you don't have your ID with you, you left it at home, for example, that's fine. You can sign the affidavit. Um, and if you simply don't have a photo ID, that is also okay and you can sign the affidavit. So if you didn't bring it with you or if you don't own one, either way, you have the affidavit option. Now, because the elections are a ways away, you do have time to obtain an ID if you do not currently have one. And one can be obtained at your local Secretary of State branch for $10. It can also be obtained for free if you are part of any of the qualifying groups, and those groups include people ages 65 years or older, legally blind, veterans, people experiencing homelessness, people who are adding or removing the organ donor registry heart sticker. If you have had your driving privileges terminated due to a physical or a mental disability, and if you are receiving state aid of any kind. If you'd like this information sent to you or you have any questions, you can give us a call at the Healthier Black Elder Center. Again, our number is 313-664-2616. If you'd like to email, you may also email me. Um, my email address is swhitney, so that's S-W-H-I-T-N-E-Y at wayne.edu. Okay, next we have Julie Ober Allen, Tommy Lewis, and Marita Harris, who are all researchers that would like to share some information about current studies that they are recruiting for. And Julie, I'll allow you to go first. All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Ober Allen, and I am a health promotion faculty member at the University of Oklahoma. So hello from very far away. We're in the middle of a, a winter storm, uh, but I actually lived in Michigan for about 18 years. I worked at the University of Michigan, and today uh, we are recruiting for a study. Um, a couple of you actually may have heard from us this summer. It's an ongoing study called the Experiences of Aging in Society Project. The goal of the project is to learn directly from older adults ages 50 and up uh, about their feelings, expectations, and experiences with growing older, um, but then also to investigate how these may affect, may affect your health, whether now or in the future. Uh, and of course, the goal of the program is to provide information to inform programs, policies, and research that promotes healthy aging. Um, so if you're interested, um, there's sort of two parts to the study. The first is a survey that takes about 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, and then the second part is optional. Um, so if you do the survey and you want to be done, you're welcome to, to be done. Uh, but if you're interested in, in doing a little bit more and sharing with us, there's a, a second briefer survey um, or an in-depth interview. Uh, I did put pictures of our team on the screen for those of you who are connected via computer so you could um, see who some of my students are. They're absolutely fantastic. Um, but so that you can put a face to a name should you uh, be in touch with any of them. 
about the project. Uh, each time participants either complete a survey or do an interview, you know, we will send you a gift card as a thank you um, for sharing with us. Uh, and if you are interested, um, our contact information is on your screen, uh, but you can also reach out to Sarah, who has a flyer that she would be more than happy to send you. Um, and feel free, you know, give us a call, send us an email, you know, we'd love to chat, tell you more about the study, um, or enroll you if you are interested. So that is it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julie. Tell me. Hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon. I'm calling in from San Francisco, so it's still morning here. But my name is Tomi, and I am one of the coordinators for the Wisdom Study, which is a nationwide breast cancer prevention and screening study. Um, we are based out of the University of California, San Francisco, but it is a nationwide study. So um, anyone living in the United States who identifies as female, who is between the ages of 40 and 74, and who has never personally had breast cancer or DCIS herself is eligible to join. Um, the goal of wisdom is to find the safest and most effective way to screen women for breast cancer. Uh, currently right now, um, many medical institutions use a one size approach where all women over 40 are recommended to screen and get a mammogram every year. And Wisdom is trying to figure out if that's actually the best way to be screening women for breast cancer, as there may be women who are at lower risk for developing the disease and who may be over screened by going every year, and women who are at very high risk of developing breast cancer who may be under screened by going in only once a year. So um, Wisdom is an online study, so you do not need to come into any clinic to sign up. You can enroll at our website, www.thewisdomstudy.org, um, and there's no cost to participate. All of our study um, resources are available to you for free, and you do not need to change any of your current health coverage, and you are still eligible to join if you are uninsured. Um, if you have questions, I will put my personal email in the chat. Um, you can also email us at info at wisdomstudy.org if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tomi. And Marita, I will let you close out this portion. Okay. Hi everyone, I am Marita. I'm calling from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. We are also in the midst of having a snowstorm. So I completely understand as the first speaker stated. So this study is called Understanding Attitudes and Opinions Towards a Health Technology. I am recruiting for my dissertation. And the goal is to understand how health technology can support the self-monitoring of African-American adults' health to manage their chronic conditions. So this study will be an interview, which will last approximately two hours, and it will be over Zoom. Overall, to be in the study, you must be diagnosed with one or more of the following chronic conditions, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol levels or type two diabetes, be between 50 and 80 years old, English speaking, identify as black and African-American, be a US citizen and either never used a wearable device or have used a wearable device in the past or currently. And by participating in the study, you will be compensated with a $30 Amazon gift card. Again, I am Marita. I have my email and my phone number to contact me. And again, this is going to be an interview. Really, it's very laid back. It's going to feel like you're talking, or at least for me, it feels like I'm talking with a friend or a family member. And it ends up being really fun. At least for me, I learned so much. So feel free, contact me if you're interested. Thank you, Marita. 
Um, and thank you all again. Um, if anyone has any questions about the studies or would like any of the materials shared with you either by email or mailed to your home, um, please give us a call at the HBEC office. Again, our number is 313-664-2616. We will now begin our main presentation. Our speaker today is Dr. Harvey Eccles. Dr. Eccles is a board certified physician in family practice and medical quality, who has over 30 years of experience in multiple fields of medicine, including sports medicine. He has served as a clinical assistant professor of family medicine at the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Medicine, the Finch University of the Health Sciences at the Chicago Medical School, and Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. Dr. Eccles has previously served as a consulting physician to multiple athletic teams from interscholastic high school sports through the professional ranks. He currently serves as a pharmacy medical director for Oscar Health, a multi-state insurance company, and he also serves as CEO and managing partner of Sheffield Medical Consultants, a medical legal consulting firm. We want to extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Harvey Eccles. Sarah, thank you so much. I am terrifically pleased to be here. Uh, and uh, Marita, cheers for Illinois. I'm from Chicago originally. Um, I am, let's see, am I... I, am I currently not muted? Wonderful. Yeah. You're so did you did you hear anything I just said or have I been talking to myself? Oh, we heard you. We heard you. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Okay. Nobody looked at me oddly. So but Maria, as I said, I'm I'm from Chicago. So so cheers to, to Illinois. I am currently coming to you this morning from Plano, Texas, uh, which is where I live now. It is uncomfortably cold here, but we don't have any snow. So uh, let me share my screen. And one other thing, the thing that, that Sarah didn't mention to any of you all is that Sarah and I are cousins, which is how she found me. Yes. And she asked me <laughs> if, if I would uh, uh, consent to do uh, uh, have a conversation with a group of friends. And I said, of course I would, because any time that I get the opportunity to speak to anybody and they have to sit there and listen to me, it's gonna be a good afternoon. So I'm anticipating that this is going to be a good afternoon. <laughs> so <you>. let's, <laughs> okay. Uh, so my hope is that you can see my screen, which should say staying fit after 50. Yes, we can. Outstanding. My life is getting better and better and better. And let me make sure that I can see what I'm doing. Okay. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about staying fit after 50, because after all, that's why we're here. Or a healthy elder is a happy elder. Um, if, if you would want to get in touch with me, I have none of my information there at all, but Sarah has all of my information. So if you will get in touch with Sarah, she will put you in touch with me. And I am certainly happy to, to field any, any questions or comments or concerns or, or anything either. Uh, during the presentation or after the presentation. So um, as, as Sarah pointed out, my, my love is medicine, but my absolute love is sports medicine. I am fellowship trained in that. And so as such, I have a couple of questions for you that have to deal a little bit with sports medicine. My first question, what sport, and you can, you can put this in the, in the chat box, if you will, and, and Sarah, I'm not able to see the chat box as I'm talking, but if you will holler that out, if any answers come in, uh, or you can answer it to yourself and I will answer it as, as we move along. What sport causes the greatest number of injuries annually in the United States? Anybody with any guesses? We have football. Okay. That was my guess, football, football. Okay, that's not right. What? That is not right. Boxing, they have someone who said boxing. And that's not and right gymnastics. either. It's running. <laughs> running. It is running. Now, what sport causes the greatest number of serious injuries annually in the United States? Any responses? We have running. Okay. 
Good, good question. Good answer, but no, it's not hockey. running. Hockey it's not football. hockey. No. Okay. Any other responses? Any other guesses? Got football, bicycle riding. Who said bicycle riding? That it is bicycle about. riding. Bicycle okay. riding causes the greatest number of serious injuries in the United States per year. Wow. What sport causes the greatest number of deaths annually in the United States? Hmm. We have running again, hiking, skiing. No, no, no. Question mark. <laughs> it wouldn't be that one either. Ready for this? It's swimming. Oh. Swimming. No, you don't think of that typically as a sport. Exactly. And certainly competitive swimming doesn't cause the greatest number of deaths. But yes, the greatest number of deaths in any sport or sporting type activity in the United States per year is swimming. Wow. We have my now, here said, wow. <laughs> yes. It is not enough that we have the sport that causes the greatest number of injuries the sport that causes the greatest number of serious injuries and the sport that causes the greatest number of deaths in the United States. Oh no, we need to combine them into a triathlon. I have never in my life understood why anybody competes in a triathlon. If we have any triathletes here, you have my admiration, but I wonder about you. Now, Let's talk a little bit about staying fit after 50. There are nine or 10 uh, subjects that I'm going to go through here. And at any point in time, feel free if there's a question, chime in. And again, I cannot see the chat box, but uh, Sarah, if you will, you know, stick your finger up in the air or, or holler or something, then I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm happy to, to stop and entertain those. <laughs> you got it. No problem. First way. Eat a balanced diet. And then for the people who are on the phone who can't see this, uh, I will try to be as explicit as possible so that you have uh, an understanding as to what's going on. But I will tell you, you're missing out on quite a show. I'm, I'm sorry about that, but there's, there's nothing we can do. In any event, let's move on. Eat a balanced diet. Veg out. What you want to consume, two cups of fruit, two and a half cups of vegetables per day. You want to include legumes, beans, starchy vegetables, and dark green and orange colored vegetables. The darker green, the better. And that actually is, is really good advice now because the dark green vegetables typically are your winter vegetables. Kale, uh, um, chard, spinach, those are the uh, collards. Those are the winter vegetables. Um, mustard greens, turnip greens, and so typically you'll find, you'll be able to find those more often uh, uh, in great supply in any of your supermarkets. Uh, absolutely, you want to get in whole grains and three cups per day of fat-free or low-fat milk or milk products. If you are lactose intolerant, there are uh, lactose-free milk products on the market. But again, especially as you're aging, and we'll talk about this in just a couple of minutes, um, because of the calcium content, you certainly want to get in as much, uh, uh, as I said, three cups of fat-free or, or low-fat milk per day. Trim your fat. You don't want to get rid of fat completely. That, that doesn't serve you well. But you do want to limit the intake to 20 to 30 percent of your total caloric intake per day and no more than 10% saturated fat intake. So for those who have issues with uh, cardiovascular problems, heart problems, high blood pressure, uh, certainly you want to keep your saturated fats lower. And thanks to uh, the Food and Drug Administration and, and several other uh, commissions, all of the nutritional, uh, the nutritional value of all of the products is listed on the side of the box or on the back of the box or under the box or on the side of the package. And so you can have a good idea as to what exactly you're ingesting. 
You do want to opt for lean meats and again, low fat or fat free milk products and try to keep your cholesterol intake to less than 300 milligrams daily. <clears throat> Choose the right carbohydrates. So again, include fiber rich fruits, vegetables and whole grains. And the reason you want to do that, uh, everybody is, is at one point, I'm sure, heard of uh, an infestation of locusts. What is it that makes locusts so horrible? Well, the thing that makes locusts so horrible is the same thing that kind of makes humans so horrible. Locusts do not possess an enzyme that digests cellulose and vegetables are primarily made up of cellulose. Humans don't possess that enzyme either. Cows possess it, pigs possess it, basically almost all of the livestock possesses it, but humans do not. And so as a result of that, when locusts descend on a field, they lay waste to the entire field because it takes that much food in order for them to fill themselves or to get enough nutrition because basically everything goes right through them. Well, humans, the same way, but we're eating for a different reason. You want fiber rich fruits because, again, fiber, high in cellulose, we don't digest cellulose. So, what happens? It acts like a Brillo pad as it goes through and it cleans everything out. And that's what we want. For the locusts, not so good for the farmers. For the humans, excellent for your digestion. So, lots and lots and lots of fiber rich foods fiber-rich fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. You absolutely want to limit foods with added sugars or sweeteners. And basically, the, the deeper the color, the better it is for you. I try to stay away from sugar, from white sugar. So if I'm going to use sugar products at all, I'm going to use natural sugar, uh, which is brown in color, but anything that's white, in color in terms of food has generally been bleached. And usually what that serves to do is to bleach out all of the nutrients. So you may get some of the flavor, but you're not getting any of the nutrients. So my suggestion to you is limit added sugars, limit added sweeteners, stay away from white sugar, if at all possible, stay away from white salt, if at all possible, the deeper the color, the better for you. Obviously, uh, by staying away from the added sugars and the sweeteners, you're preventing dental decay. So you do want to practice good oral hygiene. Again, cut back on sugar and starch containing foods uh, with added sugar, added starch. You do want to eat high starch in terms of fresh fruits and vegetables. Again, that's the cellulose that's going to go straight through and help to clean out your system. I have a question. I have an answer. Let's have <laughs> Marla asks, how can one support getting enough potassium? I understand that when one's potassium is out of whack, that can spell big issues. It can. Ask me that question in about 20 minutes because okay. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So excellent question. And I will come back to that as we're going through. I'm gonna talk a little bit about vitamins and minerals and that will come up then. And if, if I, I, will, I will try to speak directly to that once we've talked about vitamins and minerals. All righty. Eating a balanced diet, skimp on the salt. You, what you want is a, less than 2,300 milligrams of salt per day. That's about a teaspoon of salt per day. Now, the reason why that seems so low is because there is salt or sodium, again, one of our minerals, in almost every food that you eat, it is, especially if you're eating processed foods, which isn't great for you. But there is so much sodium that very, very seldom should you need to add salt yourself. And I have a number of relatives who sit down at the dinner table and before they even reach for a fork, they reach for the salt. Less than a teaspoon of salt per day is about all that you should need. Choose and cook your foods with a little bit of salt and here's the potassium. Eat potassium rich fruits and vegetables. Again, your dark leafy green vegetables, beans, potatoes, squash, avocados, mushrooms, bananas. All of those have sufficient numbers of potassium in them. 
The only issue with potassium is if you have kidney failure, not kidney disease, but kidney failure. If, you're, if you have kidney failure, getting too much potassium can be a problem. I won't speak to that directly as much as I will say, if you have kidney failure, you are probably under the care of a physician. And that's certainly something that you should bring up with your regular doctor or with your kidney doctor. If you don't bring it up with them, they will bring it up with you, trust me, because the kidney is so integral to maintaining and managing your potassium levels that that's one of the things that they look at and one of the things they manage. Curb your alcohol intake. This is usually where everybody gets up and walks out of my lectures. If you drink, drink in moderation. For women, that is one drink per day or less. For men, that is two drinks per day or less. And that's not being sexist. What it has to do with, honestly, is body mass. And so typically, um, because men have the male uh, hormone testosterone, we tend to have more muscle mass. Testosterone is the male hormone, estrogen is the female hormone, and estrogen tends to add fat. Testosterone tends to add muscle tissue. Muscle tissue is much more adept at uh, um, processing protein and other nutrients. Fat, honestly, is a place saver. It sits there until your body needs it because it's starving and then you begin to metabolize the fat. But because the fat is not processing protein or any other nutrients, because it's simply sitting there, what it does is it takes up stuff like alcohol. And so if a man is drinking two drinks a day, he's going to process that alcohol much more efficiently than a woman who is drinking more than a drink a day because her fat is going to take it up and just hang on to it. And that's never a good ending for anybody where the, the man, because of the higher muscle tissue content is going to process that alcohol. So it isn't sexist as much as it's biologic, but that's the reason for women, one drink a day, for men, two drinks a day. And it's important for me to note here that that's not an average. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is don't go Monday to Friday and don't have anything and then say, okay, it's the weekend. I can make up for all of the drinks I didn't have Monday through Friday. It doesn't work that way. So it is a drink a day or two drinks a day. That's it. No more. And actually, I would be happy if you weren't drinking two drinks a day. But that's just me. I won't tell you how to do what you do. I will only tell you whether or not it's healthy for you. You want to fortify your diet with B, vitamin B12. You want to eat food supplemented with vitamin B12. And again, the examples you can see here, shellfish, red meat, low fat dairy, cheese, and eggs. The, what the vitamin B12 is going to do is it is instrumental in, in maintaining skin integrity. It is essential in maintaining blood vessel integrity and muscle integrity. So you want to get in as much vitamin B12 as you can. And again, we'll talk about vitamins in just a moment. Like now. So <laughs> consider taking supplements. Vitamins are compounds vital to life. That's actually why they were named vitamins because they're, they're vital to life. A vitamin deficiency leads to a disease state. Two kinds of vitamins, you have water-soluble vitamins and you have fat-soluble vitamins. Your water-soluble vitamins must be replenished daily. They include all of the B-complex vitamins and vitamin C. So you can't overdose on water-soluble vitamins. You may see when you're looking at the side of a box, back of a box, bottom of a box, whatever, and it will tell you the minimum daily requirements for vitamins. It will never tell you the maximum daily requirements for vitamins because we don't know that. We don't know that because everybody's different. So we know the minimum amount that you need in order to do what it is you need to do, but the maximum amount varies per person, per activity, per size, per metabolism, for all of that. So we can't tell you how much you need, but we can tell you how little is going to get you into trouble. 
again, you cannot overdose on the, on the vitamin C and any of the B complex vitamins, get in as much as you can because they're water soluble. So as soon as you get them in, your body's going to dissolve them. You're going to use what you need. You're going to urinate out the rest of them. So eat as much as you can daily. Different story with the fat soluble vitamins. The fat soluble vitamins are stored in your body's fat supply and in certain organs. Those vitamins are vitamins A, D, E, and K. It is easier to accumulate toxic amounts of those vitamins than it is with the water soluble vitamins. Very rarely will you accumulate toxic amounts unless you're taking an ungodly amount or if you have a medical issue going on. So if you have a medical issue going on, as an example, kidney failure. If you have kidney failure, you're going to have problems regulating the, your amount of vitamin K. Uh, you're gonna have problems regulating your amount of potassium. But again, that's something that's gonna be managed by your nephrologist, your kidney doctor. So I wouldn't worry for just the average person don't worry necessarily about, oh my God, am I taking too much? Am I taking too little? The body is a wonderfully adaptive organism. So it will adjust and it will adapt. If you have a problem with vitamins, trust me, you've got a problem with something else first and we'll treat the something else and the vitamin problem will go along. We'll, we'll treat that as we're going along with it. Minerals, natural occurring chemical substances used to perform certain biochemical reactions. So you hear about vitamins and minerals. I've talked about vitamins. Here are the minerals. The minerals are necessary for bone, blood, and nerve health. And you have your major minerals and your trace minerals. Your major minerals, you require those in large amounts, calcium, chloride, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, sulfur, and magnesium. You might note that many of those, the eums, calcium, potassium, sodium, magnesium, all of those are required to maintain the structural integrity of your body. The trace of, uh, minerals required in significantly smaller amounts, iodine, iron, zinc, selenium, fluoride, chromium, you got the eums again, copper, molybdenum, and manganese. All of them are required. If you are eating a balanced diet, you're probably getting in all of the vitamins that you need. But nobody eats a balanced diet. Nobody eats a balanced diet. I don't eat a balanced diet. And that's worse because I know better and I don't need a balanced diet. So I highly recommend taking supplements. Make sure that you remove the nutritional question mark from your plate. Vitamins in the morning, minerals in the evening. You may take one pill, which is a combination vitamin, mineral, supplement, and you take that one in the morning. That's okay. I recommend biphasic. Biphasic, two times a day. Vitamins in the morning, minerals in the evening. Why do I recommend that? Because you use your vitamins for strength, stamina, and energy. You use your minerals to replace and replenish what you, you, what you have used up over the course of the day. So I recommend taking your vitamins in the morning because that's when you're going to need your strength, your stamina, and your energy throughout the day. While you're sleeping, that's when your body rests and replenishes. So that's the time that you should take your minerals at bedtime because you're going to bed and now you get to rebuild your bony matrix and you get to, to uh, replenish all, everything that you've used up over the course of the day. You hear a lot of talk about uh, natural vitamins versus synthetic vitamins. And I'm here to tell you, natural does not necessarily mean a better product. It only means that the vitamin was made from natural substances. Let me give you an example. What's a vitamin or, or, or rather what's a supplement that, that many, if not most of us use? Caffeine. Okay. <laughs> Caffeine is natural, but too much of it can raise your blood pressure. Too much of it. Have you ever seen anybody who's amped up on six or seven cups of coffee a day? And, and they're so jittery they can't get anything. Perfect. 100% natural. Caffeine is 100% natural, but not necessarily good for you. Sarah, I hope that's not caffeine in your cup. I hope I'm not calling you out. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, I actually don't do caffeine. Okay. <laughs> very good. Very good. I don't do it very often for, for that reason. So, 
again, natural doesn't necessarily mean that it's a better product. It only means it was made from natural substances. Synthetic vitamins are made in the laboratory. And again, sometimes that's even better because we're controlling actually everything that we're putting into it. So the, the, the reason that I included this slide is, is, is not to tell you the natural is better or the synthetic is better, but don't get hung up on the natural versus synthetic because it, it isn't a necessarily a matter of, of one being better or one being worse. It is not the presence or absence of natural or synthetic. It is the quality of whatever it is you're taking. Again, a vitamin is a vitamin, no matter the source. And so some vitamins uh, that are labeled natural may be mostly synthetic, and that may not be a bad thing. According to research, and I will confess this is not research that I did, but according to research, the only vitamin better in its natural form is vitamin E, because vitamin E is absorbed better by the body than when it's in synthetic form. So look for your natural vitamin E if you're looking for supplements. But other than that, make sure you that you're getting a quality product. If you're getting a quality product, I don't think natural versus synthetic is, is, is that big a hang up. Good. Here's your quality. Buy your supplements only from reputable sources. Natural does not always mean safe. Information is your best protection against harmful medication supplement reactions. Many people will say, well, I only go to an herbal food store to get whatever it is I'm taking. And that has pluses and minuses. Before you use an herbal supplement or a nutritional supplement, you can go to medlineplus.gov. It's a government website. Go to the subheader, drugs and supplements. What that will tell you is what are you, what, what are you taking? It lists what you're taking. It lists the possible side effects. It will list the adverse effects. It will list the medication interactions. And that is critically important. Do not combine supplements with medication without speaking to your doctor or pharmacist so that you can determine whether or not you should or should not be taking various supplements. So don't just decide tomorrow, hey, you know what, Dr. Ruggles said so and I'm on my way. I'm going to the store and get a lot of nutritional supplements that may not necessarily be the best thing for you. So as with anything that you're doing, please make sure that you discuss this with your doctor or with your pharmacist or both. Again, I put my sports medicine hat on, make time for exercise. Turn back the clock. At 20, exercise is an option. At 50, exercise is essential to avoid the slow deceleration of age. Your regular exercise increases oxygen uptake so much, it's like reversing 20 years of aging. So if you're not getting any exercise now, get up off the couch, just get started. When I have counseled my patients on exercise, many times you'll say, you'll, you'll find people who will say, well, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna start exercising. I'm gonna do five minutes this week, 10 minutes the next week, 15 minutes the next week, 20 minutes the next week, 25 the next week, 30 the next week, and then I'll, and, and I'll be fit. No, you'll be horrible because nobody can increase their exercise rate that quickly. You've, if you've heard of the phrase Sidious, Altius, Fortius. What that means is stronger, higher, faster. That's the motto of the Olympics, Sidious, Altius, Fortius. And actually, I think I did that wrong. It is faster, higher, stronger, Sidious, Altius, Fortius. But I recommend if you're going to start your, an exercise program, do not increase your exercise time greater than 10% per week. Five minutes is a good starting time. So walk for five minutes, no more, no less. Walk for five minutes and then stop. The next week you're gonna walk for five minutes and 30 seconds. 10% and then stop. The next week, you're gonna walk for six minutes and three seconds. Again, 10% and then stop. After three weeks, cut back 10%, cut back to five minutes and 30 seconds for a week. And then increase again for three weeks at 10% increase and then cut back for a week. When I tell that to my patients, typically I get 
Well, geez, Doc, you know, it's going to take me almost a year to get up to 30 minutes. Yes, it will. And how long did it take you to get to the weight where you are now? So if it takes you only a year, you're doing fine. Because for most of us, it took longer than a year to get to the weight where we are now. So 10% per week is as much as you should do. You want to aim for a combination of aerobics, strength training, and stretching. Not just one, but do all of the above. Get your blood flowing while you're exercising. Either low impact, walking, swimming, or cycling. High impact, running, jogging, jumping rope. I don't care what you do. Do what makes you happy. Make sure that you're following proper technique techniques because with age, I'm sure I don't have to tell you this, with age, injuries become more chronic, more serious, and they take a longer time to heal. If you don't believe that, just look at your kids or your grandkids or all the babies. Babies run down the hall, trip, fall, fall flat on the face, jump up, giggle, and keep on running. The last time I fell flat on my face, trust me, I didn't jump up, I didn't giggle, and I didn't keep on running. So the younger you are, the easier it is to recover from injuries. The older you get, and certainly if I'm, if I'm talking to an audience of people above 50, as am I, take your time. Be careful. Use your proper techniques so that you don't get these chronic, long-lasting, serious injuries. Bump some iron. Sarcopenia. Sarco refers to muscle. Penia refers to loss. So sarcopenia is the process of muscle loss in older adults. It begins sometime in the early 40s, early to mid 40s. I put 40s to 50s. I put 50s there to make everybody feel better, but that's not really true. By the time you hit 50, trust me, it has already started. But it begins in the early 40s and 50s. And what you get is muscle shrinkage, decreased efficiency of, of muscle contractions, and eventual loss of muscle fiber. Strength training can halt, and it may even reverse this process. So you may increase your strength up to 100% as a weightlifting senior. And the weightlifting works because it encourages, it encourages muscle tissue to grow, become more responsive, and more powerful. Again, I am not suggesting that you run out and buy a set of barbells and start trying to crank 50 or 60 or 70 pounds above your head. But anything that you're lifting, honestly, if you didn't lift it last week and you're lifting it this week, it's an improvement. And so what I will frequently tell people to do is not to run out and buy a new set of barbells because most folks using barbells, using your lifting weights like that, it's kind of like your New Year's resolution. You do it for a couple of weeks and then you stop and you don't come back to it. But you know what almost everybody buys almost all the time? Milk. Okay, so when you finish that gallon of milk, don't throw away the bottle, plastic bottle, save it. Buy another plastic bottle of milk. And when you finish that, don't throw the bottle away, save it. Now, fill both of those bottles up halfway with water and you've got weights. And when you get good at those, fill them the rest of the way up with water and you've got heavier weights and you can accomplish all of the weightlifting you need to accomplish with full gallon bottles of milk or half gallon bottles of milk. But try doing that because it's efficient. You've gotten some work out of the milk and you get some work out of the bottle as well. And you haven't spent a whole lot of money on a weight set that's going to sit in your basement and not do anything. Benefits of stretching. It is a basic element of exercise. You should devote time to stretch at least three times a week. Frequently, you will find people, again, I'm going to start my running component, and they'll get out, they'll start running around the block, and they won't stretch before they run around the block. You should at least begin to warm up your muscles so that your muscles do not experience the shock of going from standing still to running at full speed. Add stretching to your daily exercise routine. Absolutely stretch after strength training or aerobic exercise because both of those naturally tighten muscles. So 
the ache that you feel after exercise can be significantly decreased by stretching after exercise. I will not promise that the ache will go away, but the ache will get better by stretching after exercise. Stretching counters muscle tightness by slow muscle lengthening. So what happens is, if, if you think about, take a rubber band. Everybody knows what a rubber band looks like. And if you take a rubber band and you put it in your refrigerator for 15 minutes, take it out, grab it, and stretch it, what's going to happen to that rubber band? It's probably gonna break. Your muscle tissues work the same way. Now, put that rubber band in the refrigerator for 15 minutes, take it out, rub it between your hands for five minutes, and then stretch the rubber band, what's going to happen? It's going to stretch, it's not going to break. Again, the same analogy can be used for muscle tissue. So stretch before you exercise, and then after you exercise, stretch again to help the muscles warm down. Everyone's familiar with the phrase warming up before you go do exercise. Very few of us warm down, but you should warm down as well. Exercise cuts your cancer risk 30 to 50% with risk exercise. It reduces fat. These are all, all of the benefits. Reduces fat, you get an immune system boost. It stimulates white blood cell production. White blood cells are your first line of defense against invaders. It helps to defeat diabetes because it improves insulin uptake. And I used to do this all the time. Again, when I was practicing, I'd have my diabetic patients come in. I would check their blood sugar. Then I'd put them on a treadmill for 15 minutes. Then I'd check their blood sugar again. And they were always amazed because their blood sugar had come down because your body uses sugar for energy. So if you're not exercising and you've got diabetes, you've got all this sugar just sitting around in your system, not doing anything. But if you're exercising, now you've got that sugar going into muscles, helping to provide muscles with energy. So you help to defeat diabetes. You can lower your blood sugar simply by regular exercise. Keeps your bones strong, fewer falls, fewer fractures. It boosts brain power by improving blood flow to the brain. It strengthens your heart. You can cut your heart attack risk 50% with 30 to 45 minutes of brisk. I didn't put brisk in there, but brisk exercise three times weekly. So when you're exercising, I don't think I included this in the slides and that's, that's to my detriment. You want to, inc you want to increase your heart rate to 60 to 90% of your maximal heart rate. What is your maximal heart rate? Your maximal heart rate is 220 minus your age. So 220 minus your age is your maximal heart rate. And you want to increase your exercise heart rate to 60 to 90% of your maximal heart rate. So just some numbers you can play with to figure out, am I getting risk exercise? Am I getting enough exercise? So if you just go kind of out for a stroll or on the park and you're watching the, the kids play and listening to the birds sing and okay, that's probably not the exercise level that you want. Some exercise is better than no exercise. So the fact that you're walking is better than the fact that you're sitting on the couch and not doing anything. But once you get started, now you've got a goal for where you want your heart rate to be. 60 to 90% of your maximal heart rate is where you want your exercise rate to be. The, the faster, the better when we start to talk about brisk exercise. Drink more water. Revitalize with nature's wonder. The body works on water. The body is, is something like 80% water. Drink more water. How much? You should be drinking your lean body weight in ounces of fluid per day. I'll talk about lean body weight in a minute because nobody knows what that is. 50% of your fluid intake should be water. That is the biggest question I get is, Doc, how, yeah, yeah, I, don't, I don't like water. You know what? I don't like water either, but I drink it anyway. 50% of your fluid intake should be just plain old straight water. The other 50% could be whatever kind of fluid you want it to be. The clearer, the better. Why? Because the clearer the fluid is, the less your body has to work in order to digest it and process it. So 
Clear fluids, you know, you get sick, you go to your doctor, the doctor says what? Drink clear fluid. That's why they say drink clear fluid. The body doesn't have to work as hard to process it. Eliminate other drinks, juice, pop, alcohol, because uh, eliminating those drinks can cut out a huge portion of sugar, calories, and other harmful chemicals. So I prefer to drink the flavored water. Again, it has no calories. Uh, it has like fruit infusion or something like that, so that I get a little bit of a taste of something, but I'm not getting all the calories. I'm not packing on the pounds. Drink more water. Here's your lean body weight. So again, if you if you should let me let me scroll back to that one slide. Drink your lean body weight in ounces of fluid per day. Here's how you calculate your lean body weight. This is according to insurance actuarial tables. What are actuarial tables? Those are the tables that the insurance company uses to figure out whether or not they should sell you life insurance and how much they should charge you to purchase life insurance. So they figure out your age, your race, your sex, your body habits, and they put all that into a formula and they figure out, okay, you're probably going to live until you're 80 years old. So, okay, we'll insure you as opposed to somebody else. And they say, well, no, nah, you know, you're already past your sell by date. So we're not going to sell you any insurance because that's a losing proposition for us. That's what the insurance actuarial table is. A female should weigh hundred pounds at five feet tall, adding five pounds for every inch above five feet, give or take, give or take 10% of her body weight. A man should be 106 pounds at five feet with six pounds for, for, for every inch above five feet, give or take 10% of, the, of their body weight. I am five foot nine. So at five foot nine, I should be 106 pounds plus 54 more pounds. So I should be 160 pounds at five foot nine, plus or minus 10% of my body weight. So 16 pounds to the positive, 16 pounds to the negative. So anywhere from 144 to 176 pounds is about where I should weigh. I'm not going to tell you what I weigh because I'm not in that range, but I'm working on that every day. You know, what I, what, honestly, what I can tell you is I'm about 198 pounds. So I am in good physical condition, but according to the actuarial tables and according to all of the, the, the charts that, that talk about weight, I am overweight. Now, Overweight does not necessarily mean being over fat. And that's the reason why, to go back to one of my earlier slides, that's the reason we talk about getting in low fat food and low fat milk, because I'm not necessarily over fat, I'm just overweight. The difference being, you'll see there was a football player who played for the Bears years and years and years ago. I won't name his name because I won't call him out, but he was six foot four, 280 pounds. Was he overweight? Yes, by every measure of weight we have, he was overweight. Was he over fat? No, he had a 4% body fat. So what that means is of the 280 pounds, about 11 of those pounds was fat and everything else was bone, muscle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he was not over fat, but most of us who are 280 pounds are pretty much over fat. So I encourage you, drink more fluid, get more exercise, Eat more low fat foods because what you're trying to do is increase your weight relative to your fat and weightlifting helps with that as well. Seven reasons to drink more water. Energy boost, decreased appetite, greater calorie burn, improved digestion, joint lubrication, improved heart function, and decreased diabetes risk. Do you, eat, do you need any more reasons to drink more water? That should pretty much cover everything that's going on in your life at any one point in time. Increase your energy, decrease your appetite, burn more calories, improve your digestion, joint lubrication, Lord knows I need that. Improve your heart function and decrease your risk of diabetes. Dr. Eccles, we have, real quick, we have a question from Marla. Um, yes. Is it true that one can drink too much water in a given day? You can, but that would be really, really, really tough to do. Um, I would be curious as to, the answer is yes. The answer is yes, you can. I have honestly not ever seen anyone who drank too much water except people who have psychological difficulties 
um, or people who are not processing fluid correctly. And again, they have illnesses that we're addressing as well, so that as we address the illnesses, that tends to go away. So it is theoretically possible. In my experience, I have never seen anyone who did. Thank you. Certainly. Other questions? Okay. Tips to remember, even more good things about drinking water. Drinking four cups daily, more than four cups daily, you'll lose two pounds per year. When you get dehydrated, you get, how many of you know people who like this? Dehydration leads to fatigue, irritability, poor concentration, constipation, increased kidney stone risk, and bladder cancer. So if the person that you're living with is tired and irritable all the time and constipated, give them a glass of water. You will help them out and you will help you out. Mild dehydration occurs after losing less than 5% of the body's water weight. So it does not take much to begin to get dehydrated. You start to get dehydrated and all of those terrible things that I just mentioned are going to set in. Drinking mineral rich water, hard water, lowers risks of hypertension, heart disease risk and chances of dying from a heart attack. So many, 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 many people have water softeners in their home and they have water softeners because hard water is tough on clothing. It is tough on skin. Um, many people will tell you, well, I can taste the minerals in it. And undoubtedly you can. The good part about drinking hard water is sometimes you need the minerals as we talked about before. So I don't necessarily recommend that you just drink all water that came from water softener because you're losing out on a lot of the minerals that you need. Now, ideally you should get them in other parts of your diet. Maybe you will, maybe you won't, but let's go back to the, to the taking supplements part. Make sure you're getting the supplements in, especially if you've got a water softener because you're losing out on a whole lot of, of, of minerals by drinking the soft water. Lose excess weight. And again, we've talked about this a little bit eating the whole grains, legumes, fresh fruit and vegetables. We've talked about that decreasing your sweets, decreasing refined carbohydrates, processed food and unhealthy fats. Choose a diverse food plan. So wide variety, eat the rainbow as they say, eat foods of all fruits and vegetables of all different colors, shapes and sizes. Search for high flavor foods that fit into your meal plan. And if you are attempting to lose weight, Set a goal for no more than one to two pounds of weight loss per week. And when I, again, tell my patients that, and they say, Doc, if I lose one pound, I can't, one pound a week, I, I will never be in shape for my daughter's wedding. Okay, two things. First thing, I wish you had thought about that a year ago. But the second thing is, if you thought about that a year ago and you had lost a pound a week, how many weeks are there in a year? There's 52 weeks in a year. You would be 50 pounds down by now. Most of us would look significantly better with a 50 pound weight loss. Some of us would look really sick with a 50 pound weight loss, but you can stop anytime you want to. Not a lot of us need to lose a whole lot more than 50 pounds. One to two pound weight loss per week, it should be your goal, not five to 10, that's not realistic. Weight control tips, dodge dieting dangers, use smart steps for weight loss, there's no get slim quick schemes. Anyone who tells you you can lose eight to 10 pounds in the first week, that is not a healthy plan for you. That's not something that you should be doing. Make satisfying choices in terms of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and find workable maintenance strategies. You cannot give up eating. That's not workable. That's not a workable maintenance strategy. So find a strategy that helps you. And again, I encourage you, work with a weight loss professional, work with your physician so that you can find a strategy that fits your body, your system and your lifestyle. A lot of folks will tell you, well, I wanna get into a high protein diet. I have an issue with high protein diets because there's this a short term weight loss, but it's long term health concerns. If you're decreasing your carbohydrate, so you're increasing your protein. I'm eating a whole lot of meat, but I'm not eating any carbohydrates at all. You're going to decrease your carbohydrates. You're going to decrease your sugar. Decreased sugar leads to decreased glycogen, which is the storage form of sugar. You're going to decrease your, your water requirement. And we've already talked about how much water you need and how much water you should be drinking. 
you're going to, that says increased urination, that should be decreased urination, actually. It will lead to short-term weight loss. The problem is it's going to lead to long-term problems. Why? Because remember I said that glycogen is the storage form of sugar. Okay, if you're decreasing your sugar storage, then what's going to happen is you're going to burn more fat to produce energy because your body doesn't have the sugar reserves. Your liver is going to begin to produce ketone bodies, which it produces from protein. Your body is going to go into ketosis. Now, in somebody who is just a younger person who has a normal metabolism, their body can go into ketosis which produce acidosis, and that's going to burn more fat, burn more fat, burn more fat. But if you're diabetic and you start to produce ketone bodies, that's what gets diabetics into trouble. If you've heard of a diabetic coma, the medical phrase for that is diabetic ketoacidosis. You're producing acid, you're producing much more acid, which is causing you to burn much more energy, but a diabetic's body can't tolerate that. So again, you'll get to fatigue, nausea, loss of body function, and possible death. In addition to that, once you start burning fat for energy, your body begins to elevate the cholesterol because as it burns the protein and burns the fat, it liberates the cholesterol inside the protein cells, inside the fat cells, so your cholesterol level goes up. Your cholesterol level goes up, your blood sugar level goes down, you get constipated, and you increase your risk for colon cancer. Raise your hand if that sounds like a good afternoon for you. Probably not. So again, I encourage you to lose excess weight, but I do not encourage you to do it through a high protein diet. Here's your weight loss sabotage. I'm going to skip breakfast. If I skip breakfast every day, I'm absolutely going to lose weight. No, you're not. Distracted eating. Do not be distracted while you're eating. Sit down and eat. Look at your food. Don't eat while you're watching television. Or eat while you're reading things on your telephone or eat while you're reading your tablet. Concentrate on your food. Stop eating when you stop being hungry. Do not eat just because it's noon and it's lunchtime or it's five o'clock and it's dinner time. Don't count your calories. Eat until you're, you're hungry, until you're no longer hungry. When you're no longer hungry, stop eating. Lack of exercise, snacking between meals, reducing too much fat, we've talked about that, and alcohol overindulgence, those are problems, those are things that are gonna sabotage your weight loss. So as many of those as you can cut out, the better it is going to be for you. Watch your salt intake. We talked about this just a little bit. Dangers of elevated sodium, higher salt means higher blood pressure, higher blood pressure, heart attack, stroke, eye and kidney damage, impotence in men, Higher salt means you're gonna lose more calcium, so now you have an increased risk of osteoporosis in women. <clears throat> and if anybody suffers from ulcers, ulcers are typically caused by H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori, which is a bacteria that lives in the stomach. Salt makes Helicobacter pylori much more powerful. So increase your salt intake and you're at greater risk for, having, uh, for getting uh, stomach ulcers. A mentally fit, learn something new, enjoy games and puzzles, increase your reading. We're getting to a point now where everybody's on an electronic device of some type. Read more, increase your reading, keep your brain mentally fit. Get enough sleep. At our age, not as you age, your sleep patterns change, your sleep needs do not. When you're 20, you get two hours of deep sleep per night. By 65, all you need is 30 minutes of deep sleep per night. But the problem is older people produce less melatonin and melatonin is a substance that helps you with deep sleep because sleep needs vary. You need to find the amount at which leaves you feeling well rested. We are not all going to need eight hours of sleep. Some of us may need 10 or 11. Some of us may need four or five. So you need to find out what works for you. Beware of sleep robbers. See your physician about these teeth grinding. GERD, heartburn, obstructive sleep apnea, and restless leg syndrome. All of these can be issues overnight. So if you have those or if you're not getting enough sleep, bring this to the attention of your doctor. Get your sleep naturally. Learn new bedtime habits. Wait until you're sleepy. Use the bedroom only for sleeping and sex. Get your television out of your bedroom 
Put your books down. When you go into the bedroom, go in to go to sleep. Don't go in to hang out and then do everything else and listen to the music. No, no, no. Use your bedroom only for sleep because that's going to help to improve your attitude towards sleep. Get a boosted breakfast. Eat breakfast that helps you get you started on your day. It helps you build energy. It helps you build good sleep habits because you're using your energy naturally. It is declining over the course of the day so that by the time it's time to go to bed, you're ready to go to bed. Reduce your stress. Sweat it out with exercise. Laugh it out. You decrease your cortisol, which is the stress hormone, and your epinephrine level. Your epinephrine, adrenaline, same thing. That's what gets you wired up when you're excited, but it's tough to decrease your stress when you're excited. Sleep it off by going, getting adequate sleep. You decrease blood pressure and cortisol levels. Relax it away by deep breathing exercises, muscle relaxation, and talk it out. Talk with your friends, your family, talk with a therapist so that you're decreasing your stress in that fashion. Mind soothing minerals, we get back to the minerals again, magnesium and calcium help to soothe the mind. Omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin C, and your B vitamins help to control your cortisol levels. And again, your B and C vitamins, you can't overdose on those, so get as much as you can. Practice your spiritual beliefs, prayer, meditation, and reflection. Whatever your particular brand of spirituality is, the positive benefits, <coughs> excuse me, Positive benefits, reduce stress, lower epinephrine and cortisol, increase your positive emotions, decrease your breathing rate, lower your blood pressure, decrease your heart rate, provide a stronger immune system. So I, I cannot stress that enough to practice your spiritual beliefs. Now, I have to apologize because this next slide, after telling you to practice your spiritual beliefs, people look at me sideways when I come up with the next one. Keep having sex. A vibrant sex life boosts your health. It battles built-up tension. It's a natural stress killer. It works out and loosens up every muscle in the body. It protects against pain because it produces endorphins, which are the body's natural painkillers. It improves fitness. Active sex burns 300 calories per episode. Now, when I did the research, it told me about this, but I don't know anybody who actually follows this. Three to four times a week, you can lose 12 pounds in a year without changing your diet and without exercise, changing your exercise level. Your libido feeding foods, you want to decrease fat. High fat foods give you high blood pressure and heart disease. Eat sex friendly foods, fruits, vegetables, fiber, garlic, oysters, spinach, red meat. All of those have high zinc content again, which helps blood flow, improving your blood flow, decreasing your blood pressure, helps your sex drive. It keeps your weight down. Obesity can uh, leads to diabetes and hypertension, which is a cause of impotency in men and decreased libido in women. Stop smoking. If you are smoking, you have my permission and my doctor's order. Stop today. Stop right now. Two cigarettes smoked before intercourse significantly re re reduce blood flow to the genitalia. Limit your alcohol. Too much alcohol can cause temporary impotence or loss of libido. Long-term alcohol use, as I'm sure you know, leads to nerve and liver damage. And that's it. Questions that I can answer. Thank you, Dr. Eccles. Um, again, everyone, you can use the chat box or the Q&A box to answer any or to ask any questions that you have. Um, one that I have is as far as melatonin, are melatonin supplements something that you would suggest using if you're having trouble sleeping? Yes, I absolutely recommend it. Because again, melatonin is a, it, melatonin is a naturally occurring substance. We produce melatonin. But as we get older, we produce less and less and less melatonin. So what I would encourage you to do is uh, let me see if I can. I'll get back to you with the website, the, the website that I named earlier, because I don't have it memorized. Um, but again, it's not a matter of quantity. It's a matter of quality. So make sure that you're getting a, a quality 
uh, melatonin supplement. But yes, if you are having difficulty sleeping, I absolutely recommend taking melatonin supplements. Okay, thank you. Sean, did you capture any other questions in the chat? Uh, here, here's another question about uh, about stretching and, and post-workout uh, times. What is, what's a good philosophy for rest uh, between exercise, particularly for those who might be reintroducing exercise into their day-to-day -day life? I'm not quite sure what you mean when you, what do you mean when you say a good philosophy for rest? Right, like how often can we can we do daily exercise or in the process of working mm -hmm. up, should we have rest days involved in there or should we focus really mainly on stretching on those types of days? I would, I would stretch, yes, thank you. I would stretch every day. I would exercise four to five times per week. So four to five times per week, getting your heart rate up to 60 to 90% of your maximal rate stretching every day and as i said you take a a one week 10 percent vacation so the scenario i described to you where you exercise five minutes then 5 30 then 603 then cut back to 5 30 and then go to 603 i think the next one is 618 and then or, or 644 and then 718 and then cut back to 644. Um, so I would recommend doing that until you get to 20 minutes per exercise, uh, 20 minutes of exercise per session. And so, yes, uh, in short, exercise four to five times per week, stretch every day and take a 10 percent vacation every three weeks. So three weeks of increasing and then one week of decrease, then three weeks of increasing, and then one week of decrease. Right, and if it good. hurts, stop doing it. If there, if you've got something that's painful, pain is your body's way of telling you there's something wrong. That's when you need to see your doctor. Uh, another question here in the chat. Uh, can you speak to uh, alkaline water or, or possibly just drinking bottled water uh, as, as your water source? Is that recommended? Water is recommended, period. Water is recommended. I am not as great a fan as, of alkaline water as are some people. And the reason for that is because if your kidneys are functioning correctly, drinking alcohol, uh, alcohol, oh, let's do that again. If your kidneys are functioning correctly, drinking alkaline water isn't going to make a difference because as soon as that water hits your kidneys, your kidneys are going to add acid to it to normalize the pH. pH is the relative acidity or alkalinity of any fluid. Normal pH for a human is anywhere from 7.35 to 7.45 on a 14 point scale. If your pH in your blood is seven, you're dead. If your pH in your blood is eight, you're dead. So the body maintains it between 7.35 and 7.45. You can drink as much alkaline water as you want. If your kidneys are working, it's going to normalize that by adding more acid to it. So it's going to get it somewhere between 7.35 and 7.45. Alkaline is the high side. So if you're drinking alkaline water and you're trying to get your blood fluid level up to, I don't know, 7.5, that's too high and your body's gonna adjust it down. If you're drinking acid water and you're trying to get your, your, your body's acidity level up, bringing it down, your body's going to adjust it. So I'm not a big fan of alkaline water necessarily. I am a big fan of water. As long as your body is functioning appropriately and you're getting in fluid, everything should be fine. All right, and a follow-up, uh, Dr. Eccles uh, from Kathleen. Uh, could you uh, remind us how much water we should drink in a day once more, please? One ounce for every pound of body weight. So if you think about it, every molecule in your body is producing waste, every molecule. So every ounce of body, anything, body cells is producing waste. You need an ounce for every pound of, I said that wrong, every pound of, of body substance is producing waste. 
you need one ounce of fluid for every pound of body that's producing waste. But that's lean body weight. So again, let's say I'm five feet tall, I'm a man, I should be 106 pounds. I should be drinking 106 ounces of fluid per day because I'm 106 pounds. Now, let's say I'm fat, 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 and instead of being 106 pounds, I'm 212 pounds. You don't double the amount of fluid just because you've doubled the weight. You should be drinking one, pound, one ounce for every pound of body weight, of lean body weight, of ideal body weight per day. So, and again, male, 106 pounds and five feet, plus six pounds for every inch. Female, 100 pounds, plus five pounds for every inch. So with that calculation, you can figure out how much fluid daily you should be getting in. That will change as you exercise. The more you exercise, the more fluid you need. One quick tip, once you feel thirsty, you are past needing fluid. By the time you sense thirst, you're dehydrating and you need to increase your fluid. You should never feel thirsty. That's the ideal goal. Excellent, thank you for that. I am not seeing anything else in the Q&A box or the chat right now. Uh, Sarah, do you have any other questions? I think that is all the questions that I received. Um, I have shared Dr. Eccles' email in the chat as well as mine and the phone number to HBEC. And I'll give one more moment for any last minute questions, if anyone has any. Oh, okay, we have one. Well, what is my maximum heart rate if I am 67 years old? You're gonna make me do that math. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You know what? I am I am sitting here in front of a calculator, so I'm gonna do this real quick. 153 is your maximum heart rate. Yeah. Yeah, so 220 minus the age. 220 minus the age. So the age. your your lower heart rate, if you're exercising, should be 92 beats a minute. And wait, how old were they? 67. 138 beats a minute. So 92 to 138 is where your, your heart rate should be if you're exercising. So it's 220 minus your age. That gives you your maximum heart rate. And then it's 60 to 90% of that is, is where your heart rate should be while you're exercising. All right, one more question I see in here. Sarah asks, um, are there any benefits to adding coconut water to your diet? It tastes good. Number one, love coconut water. Number two, um, coconut water slash coconut oil has anti-inflammatory properties. Number three, did I mention this before? Water is good. So yes. <laughs> It tastes good, anti-inflammatory properties, and it's water, which means you're getting hydration. Wonderful. All right. And then I think the last thing here is how can we get a copy of this presentation? Um, if anyone would like uh, the slides, are we able to share your slides, Dr. Eccles? I sure. Um, you want to so contact I, me offline and I'll, I'll send you the presentation. Yeah, I can yeah. I'll just email you the presentation. I'm certainly happy to do that. Wonderful. Yep. So I will have copies um, that I can email out to you if you contact us at the Healthier Black Elder Center. Um, again, that number is 313-664-2616. And I can just go ahead and email it or send it snail mail, however you'd like to receive it, we will make sure that you get a copy. Okay. Now we're right down to the wire at the last moment. Um, we had a couple of comments, wonderful presentation, Dr. Eccles. Thank you Thank so you. much. 
Um, we had another comment earlier. What an excellent presentation and from a doctor. I'm encouraged to start doing better today. Straightforward and easy to understand and the slides were clear and succinct as well. Would really appreciate having a copy. I will make sure, Sarah, I will send those to you today. Okay, perfect. All righty. Well, we'll we will go ahead and close. Um, thank you again. We want to extend our thanks to you, Dr. Eccles, for such an excellent presentation and very engaging presentation on staying fit and aging. Um, we want to also thank our researchers for providing information about this, their research studies this morning. Um, I want to extend a special thank you to our Critical Crossroads Committee um, for their hard work and their attention to the social issues that we've all been facing. And finally, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, today's presentation has been recorded. So if you'd like to share it with a friend or watch it again, we will be uploading it to our Lunch and Learn Recordings webpage. Again, our website is www.mcuaaar.org. And if there's anyone with us who is not yet a member of the Healthier Black Elders Center uh, community, then we would like you to reach out and ask questions and possibly join. So we can sign you up again over the phone. Our number is 313-664-2616. And when you become an HBEC member, you will receive our biannual newsletter. You will learn about research studies like the ones that you've heard about today. And you will get information about future programming like this program. Thank you again to everyone. I hope you all stay safe and that we will see you next month at our Lunch and Learn from Dr. Tina Chopra on COVID-19 and the latest updates that you'll need to know to stay safe and healthy. That program will be on Thursday, March 24th at 11 a.m. using the exact same Zoom information and Zoom phone call information that you use today. So we hope that you all join us then. Take care everyone and have a great afternoon. And one more, one more announcement that, that came into the chat. I just wanna highlight oh, yes. this before we log off. Uh, Dr. Uh, Julie Over Allen here. Um, again, thanks us for, for time today. And if you have any more information about the uh, Experiences of Aging in Society project, uh, please go ahead and reach out to her and her team. Um, you can email her at stresshelpdisparitieslab at ou.edu, or you can call toll free at area code 833 743. 1008. All right. Thank you very much, thank everybody, so much. and have a wonderful, healthy day. Thank you. Thank you.